Now on for our experts. In San Francisco, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson, who's also the director of the Department of Police Accountability for the city of San Francisco. And in Atlanta, defense attorney and community activist Gerald Griggs, who also serves as second vice president of Atlanta's NAACP chapter. All right, guys. Special Prosecutor Steve Schleicher gave the first half of the prosecution's closing arguments, which lasted about 103 minutes. And on the back end, the mic dropper himself, Jerry Blackwell, did the rebuttal argument. Now, give me the pros and cons of the state's closing arguments and rebuttal. Paul, you go first. All right, so a couple of things really stood out that they did really well was talking about the random people that were forced to that moment and that were forced to come to that incident to see George Ford die, and then converting those people into the jury being the people, and that they have the power. That was a really good point. The second thing that really stood out to me was the conversation about him talking about this being a decision that is pro-police. It's about the integrity of the police, that making a decision of accountability and guilt does not hurt the police. It hurts a bad person, not the police department. That was a good distinction to make. And the third thing that really stood out to me in this case was how he talked about justifying or not justifying the use of force past the point of when there was no pulse. I like that marker, and that was a good point to make. What I thought was missing, though, was them having a theme that they ran through their arguments, and I would have wanted to hear that. Them talking about the use of force in that spectrum a little bit more, and them talking about the affirmative duty to provide help as part of the definition of public safety, I wanted to hear that. And then, of course, now here's the big elephant in the room for me. I wanted a conversation about race. How are you going to have a case like this that is so about race and not talk about race at all? I don't think that that was a distraction for the jury. It was something that I wanted to hear addressed. Uh, and then the final thing that I thought was lacking a little bit, if these were my lawyers and I would have said, I want to hear a little bit of passion. I want you to personalize this conversation with the jury so that they understand that you care about this and have a reflection of the value of George Floyd. That's what I want to hear in your argument. They did a good job, but those were my All criticisms. Right. Gerald, pros and cons for you. Quickly, um, I think the cons were like what Paul said, the lack of emotion. I think that they needed more emotion in this case. It's a very emotional case. We're talking about the death of a man, nine minutes and 29 seconds where the life was choked out of him. Uh, but I think the, the, the pros were it was very professional. They hit all the points. They hit reasonable doubt. They hit all the elements. Uh, they took apart the defense's case. And I think that they will get a verdict uh, that speaks the truth and that's guilty. Uh, but I still think there should have been a little bit more passion. We're talking about a heat of the moment type case that's being viewed around the world. There needed to be that moment where we, you suck all the air out of the room and you left no doubt. I don't think that moment happened. It might have happened towards the end uh, with the photo, but it wasn't that Johnny Cochran moment that you need in all these cases. I think that's the all right. Well, now on to the defense's closing arguments. Attorney Griggs, I'm going to start with you. The defense obviously had an uphill climb from the start, but were there any pros during their argument? Um, I think the pros were they, they stuck to reasonable doubt. They stuck to arguing the state couldn't prove their case and hadn't proved their case. And I think that that was the best possible defense uh, of the cons. The science is not there and you can't argue facts that are not there. And, and you lose credibility with jurors when you argue facts that are clearly erroneous and you argue the law that's clearly erroneous. And I think the state hit them on that rebuttal. Uh, but I just think that they did the best they could with the evidence they had. Uh, but I think he was up there entirely too long. If you're the defense and you're up there explaining, you're losing. You have to make sure that you are poking holes in the state's case. And I think the state did a very good job of sealing up those holes. And you're up for longer than 45 minutes to an hour, just continuing to explain, explain, explain. Your job is not to explain. Your job is to make sure they understand that there's reasonable doubt. All right, so after the jury was excused, the defense called for a mistrial, which is typically what they do, right? Um, and so that's, for viewers who don't understand, a mistrial is basically a request to have the judge end the trial before a verdict is reached. Um, and the defense attorney, Nelson, cited immense media exposure as the reason. 
Now let's watch that moment from court while the defense attorney was making that argument. Our closing arguments, we had an in-chambers discussion about events of this weekend, uh, specifically refer referencing that a, an elected official, uh, United States congressperson, was making um, what I interpreted to be, and what I think are reasonably interpreted to be, threats against the sanctity of the jury process, um, threatening and intimidating um, a jury, demanding that if there's not a guilty verdict that there would be further um, further uh, further problems. Okay, now the defense named Democratic U.S. Representative Maxine Waters, who made a comment over the weekend while in Minneapolis. Let's listen to those comments. I am very hopeful and I hope uh, that we're going to get a verdict that is say guilty, guilty, guilty. And if we don't, we, got, we cannot go away. What happens? What should protesters do? Well, we, we got to stay on the street. Uh, and we've got to get more active. We've got to get more confrontational. All right, so we know the defense is going to try to preserve the record for appeal. But, Paul, can Representative Waters' comments be grounds for an appeal? No, I don't think so in this case. Although I, I was not surprised to hear the motion. And, you know, as a prosecutor, every time you conclude your case, your heart little clutches when defense makes this motion to have your entire case dismissed. This is one of the grounds, though, that I believe that this judge has made a complete, clear, and open record about the steps that he's taken to ensure against the standard that the defense attorney is trying to raise, which is the basis for the sequester in the first place, which is outside influence. Not just that it could happen, but that it has happened, and he hasn't laid a record of that other than talking about the possibility. And so for that reason, it doesn't matter if Maxine Waters talked about it or Shamar Moore talked about it. The issue is, can you tie and connect what's happening outside of the courtroom to this jury specifically, other than a theoretical argument, which is what he made, that it could have happened, and here's how large it is outside of this courtroom. That's a theoretical argument that won't stand ground on an appeal, and so I think it'll be dismissed. But And I think the judge has made a clear enough of a record and laid enough of a foundation to address those concerns, both in how he's handled this jury from the very, very beginning and in how he's addressing and limiting and defining the standards of being sequestered for this jury for the deliberation. Gerald, to you, judge called it abhorrent. He said he wishes that elected officials would stop talking about this trial. He's made that very clear, as Paul has just pointed out from the very beginning. What are, what are your thoughts about this? I mean, this is the most consequential trial, I think, of our, of our lifetime. And people are going to have opinions, whether they're public figures or not. Yeah, and I think that the judge needs to understand as long as it didn't affect the jury, it didn't affect what happened in that courtroom, it doesn't matter. And so I think that it was handled appropriately. A record's been made. The Court of Appeals can look at it after there's a conviction and they'll make a determination it had no effect. I mean, they didn't poll any of the jurors to see if they'd actually heard it or it made them change their mind and make them not be impartial until they heard all the evidence. So I mean, it's a red herring. Uh, I think this judge has done a good job of making the record. I don't think the defense attorney made a good enough record uh, for appeal. So I think it's a red herring. 